Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and today we're going to look at a demand side policy, specifically monetary policy. So let's take a few notes before we actually begin to graph this. So again, uh, we're looking at, I'll use, choose a quick another color, demand side policies. And uh, this is also known as demand management policies. And this refers to the central government or central bank or both trying to influence aggregate demand. And since the central government and or central bank is trying to influence aggregate demand, specifically aggregate demand, we call it a demand side policy. It's important to note that demand side policies uh, can be categorized into two parts. So one part is called fiscal policy. And the other part is monetary policy. And today's video is going to focus on monetary policy. Okay, this is important that we can distinguish between these two. And fiscal policy is looking at the central government. The central government controls fiscal policy. And they can control aggregate demand by changing tax rates, direct and indirect taxes to reduce or increase the amount of disposable income that firms and households have to spend into the economy. And they can also influence aggregate demand through their government spending, which is a component of aggregate demand. Monetary policy is looking at the role of the central bank. And the, bench, the central bank can influence aggregate demand by increasing or decreasing the supply of money. So they can influence the supply of money which then impacts the interest rate. And the interest rate will then impact aggregate demand. And this is what we're going to go over in this video. So just remember that demand side policies, it's categorized into two components, fiscal policy, which is in the domain of the central government. The central government can change direct and indirect taxes, uh, but specifically uh, direct taxes, income tax, corporate taxes to influence aggregate demand. And it also can change uh, the level of government spending to impact aggregate demand. Monetary policy is looking at the central bank the central bank's ability to increase or decrease the supply of money that's in circulation, which will then in fact uh, impact interest rates, which will then impact aggregate demand through consumption and investment spending. Okay, so let's just get rid of some of these notes and let's go ahead and illustrate, graph and analyze monetary policy so we can understand how the central bank can influence aggregate demand. Okay, and this video is going to use the monetarist model, but there'll be another video after this illustrating the same idea but on a Keynesian model. Okay, so um, <clears throat> actually, let's finish graphing this. So here we have graph A. Graph A is looking at the market for money or the money market. And graph B is using the monetarist model. And here we're illustrating, we'll be illustrating a recessionary gap, closing a recessionary gap through what we call expansionary monetary policy. So I'll just label that as closing a recessionary gap through expansionary monetary policy. 
Okay. Expansionary monetary policy. So we're going to expand the supply of money. So here we have in graph B the long run aggregate supply curve intersecting the aggregate demand curve, 81, intersecting the short run aggregate supply curve. And that provides an equilibrium price level. So we'll label that PL1. And we have an equilibrium level of output or real GDP at YP. We're at full potential GDP. Let's assume that we're looking at the United States and let's assume that the natural rate of unemployment is at about 5%. Their long run average level of unemployment. So here we're at point A. Okay. And in the money market, we have a perfectly inelastic supply of money, SM1. And it's perfectly inelastic because at any one point in time, there's only a fixed quantity of money that's in circulation. The demand for money is downward sloping, labeled DM1. And that provides an equilibrium um, interest rate over here. And we'll call that IR1, or interest rate 1. And um, perhaps let's say that the interest rate, let's use some real data. Let's assume that the interest rate is at about 1.75%. Okay. So 1 1.75% percent interest rate and the quantity supplied and demanded is at QM1 the quantity supplied and demanded for money at QM1 where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded so this is our starting point point A B I'll call this point C all right so in uh, March of 2020 we had the COVID pandemic and the United States went into lockdown. People were kept home. And as a result, uh, household consumption spending fell. And since households were spending less, firms were not willing to borrow and invest into the economy. So investment spending also decreased. So we're going to remember that AD1 or aggregate demand is equal to consumption spending plus investment spending plus government spending plus exports minus imports. And the impact of the COVID lockdown resulted in reduced household spending or consumption spending, also leading to reduced investment spending. And that's going to cause aggregate demand to shift inward. So it shifts in from 81 to 82. And we have a new equilibrium at point B, where 82 equals SRS1, and that provides an equilibrium price level falling to PL2. In the Matras model, that is leading to deflation from PL1 to PL2, and the uh, level of output decreases from YP to Y recession one. And let's assume that the unemployment rate is falling since the quantity of aggregate supply is decreasing due to the falling aggregate demand firms are firing resources like labor leading to, let's just say unemployment rises to 10%. So we have cyclical unemployment being created. Okay, so we're in a recessionary gap. 80 has shifted in leading to a fall in the price level and leading to rising unemployment and a fall in real GDP. The central bank can intervene, again, through what we call expansionary monetary policy. And how do they do that? Well, let's take a look what happened with um, the interest rates. We can see here that interest rates by the Federal Reserve Bank, the central bank of the United States, was at about 1.75%. But then we see a dramatic decrease to 0.25%. This is a result of the central bank quickly increasing the supply of money 
lowering interest rates reflective of the decreased value of money due to the increased supply of money. And the hope is since interest rates are low, it will incentivize households and firms to borrow and spend into the economy. Okay. So again, we can see here with the data that on October 31st, is the interest rates were at about 1.5, 1.75%. And then on March 3rd, they dropped it to 1 to 1.25%. And then on March 16th, this is going into the March lockdown of 2020, goes down to 0.25%. So what is the central bank doing? They are increasing the supply of money in circulation. And they do that by buying government bonds. They buy government bonds from the central government and they provide cash to the central government. So they trade and that increases the quantity of money in circulation. So supply of money shifts out from SM1 to SM2. And the equilibrium interest rate as a result falls from IR1 to IR2, in which the data reveals that it fell from 1.75% to 0.25%, and the quantity supply and demand it increases from QM1 to QM2, we're at point D. Okay? So the supply of money increasing due to the central bank expanding the supply of money by buying government bonds and offering cash that they can print to the central government and other retail banks and investors leads to the interest rates falling. When the interest rates falls, it incentivizes households to borrow and it also incentivizes, incentivizes firms to borrow and spend into the economy or invest into the economy. So we're going to assume that the low interest rate is causing households to borrow and spend and firms to also borrow and spend. And that will lead to aggregate demand shifting out from 82 to 81, thus leading to the expansionary monetary policy closing the recessionary gap. So that effectively is the idea behind expansionary monetary policy. So let's go ahead and analyze this as we would on a paper exam for the IB. As can be seen, we have two graphs. Graph A is the money market, and graph B is a mantras model illustrating uh, a recessionary gap and expansionary monetary policy closing that recessionary gap. In graph A, we are measuring the quantity of money on the x-axis and the rate of interest on the y-axis. We have a downward sloping demand for money, DM1, labeled DM1. And we have two perfectly inelastic supply of money graphs or curves, labeled SM1 and SM2. In the graph B, we are measuring real GDP on the x-axis. We're measuring the price level on the y-axis. We have a perfectly inelastic long-run aggregate supply curve, two downward sloping aggregate demand curves labeled 81 and 82, and an upward sloping short-run aggregate supply curve labeled SRAS1. In graph A, where SM1 equals DM1 at point C, it provides an equilibrium rate of interest at IR1, or we will say 1.75% with an equilibrium quantity supplied and demanded of money at QM1. Right. In, the, in graph B, where LRAS1 equals 81 equals SRS1 at point A, provides an equilibrium price level at PL1 with an equilibrium level of real GDP at YP, or full potential GDP, full employment, or at the natural rate of unemployment uh, being about 5%. As a result of the COVID pandemic and the government mandating that people stay home, that leads to a fall in consumption spending and investment spending as firms see revenues fall and they cut um, their willingness to invest into the economy. As a result, aggregate demand decreases from 81 to 82. 
establishing a new equilibrium at point B, where 82 equals SRS1, providing an equilibrium price level at PL2 and an equilibrium level of real GDP at Y recession 1. Due to the fall in aggregate demand and firms decreasing the quantity of their aggregate supply from point A to point B, or from YP to Y recession, firms begin to fire excess resources like labor, leading to an increase in unemployment from 5 to 10%, creating uh, cyclical unemployment in the economy and, in the monetarist model, a degree of deflation. So we have entered a recessionary gap. The central bank then decides to intervene. The central bank will engage in what is called expansionary monetary policy. They will expand the supply of money, and they will do that by printing money and using that money to buy government bonds. They will buy those bonds from the central government and offer uh, cash to the central government, and that will lead to an increase in the supply of money. So the supply of money increases from SM1 to SM2, providing new equilibrium at point D, where SM2 equals DM1, lowering the interest rate from IR1 to IR2, or reducing it from 1.75% to 0.25%, and increasing the quantity supply and demand of money from QM1 to QM2. As a result of the fall in the interest rate, households and firms will, will borrow money, since it is cheap now to borrow, and they will spend into the economy, leading to increased consumption and investment spending, thus pushing aggregate demand back out from 82 to 81 to effectively close the recessionary gap. And that is it. Uh, so there you have an analysis, how to graph expansionary monetary policy using a monetarist model. In the next video, I will illustrate exactly the same thing, but using the Keynesian model. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and if you have any comments or questions, feel free to comment. Thank you so much.